So this is our sixth week in this eight-week series asking one question, but a critical, massive question. Who am I? And each answer to these questions that the Bible gives, the world gives different answers. The world, the culture and the world come at it from a different perspective. We ask the question, who am I? And we said, I'm a child of God. That's good news. Made by him in his image, adopted into his family. We asked, who am I? And we said, I'm a member of God's kingdom. That I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. My first allegiance is to God and his kingdom before anything else. We ask this question, who am I? And we realize that we're destined for future glory and we're not captured by and controlled by our past mistakes. And oh, the enemy in the world likes to make you think that your past mistakes define you. But God says, I have a future for you that's beyond what you can imagine. We ask, who am I? We said, we're, we're about our call from above, that we're gifted, we're called. We can be used by God to bring him glory in this world. And we discovered that. Last week when we asked the question, who am I? We discovered that I am who God says I am. Believe it. And Pastor Keith just did a great job communicating about how, how God, what God has declared about us. In every one of these topics, if you ask the world and culture, they're going to give a different answer. But God has answers right here in this book. And in the first pages of this book, in the first book of the Bible, in the first two chapters of that book, in the opening of God's story, God answers the question, who am I? By explaining that I am a man or a woman. I am male or female. God answers that in his word. And it's interesting as I was thinking about this idea of preaching on this topic, uh, who am I? I'm a man or a woman. I realized it struck me, if I had to preach this sermon 40 years ago when I first started in ministry, people would have said, well, why would you spend a whole sermon talking about that? Everyone knows inside the church, outside the church, pretty much everyone would agree. 40 years ago, when I started in ministry, if you asked this 20 years ago, it wouldn't have changed that much, a little bit, but there'd been some conversation, but it would have seemed, oh, it's pretty straightforward. If I had to preach this five years ago, people would have said, oh, that's kind of, you know, maybe a little edgy, kind of in the way, the way the, what's happening in the world, but it's 2024. And people, some people are thinking, pastor, why would you touch this hot potato? Why would you deal with this topic in the church? That's just in my lifetime. I'm not that old. Any amens? <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. Slow roll, people. Come on. And I'm not that old. Yeah, that, that, that was just pathetic. That was <laughs> I don't know if you mean it, but thank you. <laughs> um, but this, this is a tough topic in our world today. And so, Lord Jesus, we just pause right now and we come to you. And we say, Lord, speak to our hearts. When you came, Jesus, when you walked on this planet again and again and again in the Gospel of John, the story of you, Jesus, it says, Jesus, you came in grace and truth, in grace and truth, in grace and truth. So I pray that today, as I open your word, as we study the scriptures together, I pray that you will come to us with grace, amazing grace, and truth, unwavering truth. And that God, as your servant, wanting to serve you and serve your church, this church that I love so much, I pray that you will help me communicate with grace and truth for your glory. Open our hearts, open our minds to receive what you want to say to us today, we pray in your glorious name, Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to the very beginning. 
not hard to find. If you have your Bible app, it's the same as finding anything. Just put in Genesis 1, uh, and you'll find it. Put in the passage with your Bible app, but with your Bibles. And it'll also be on the screens online. This will be on the screens on campus, on the screens. And, and even though this is, a, a, for some people, a very difficult and challenging topic, I want to invite you to, just to stay with me through the whole message, to listen with an open heart, uh, to listen to God's word. And if you're a follower of Jesus, to say, God, I want to hear what you have to say. Even if I might have a different perspective, even though I might be struggling with some things, I want to hear what you have to say. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we always have a lot of people that are visiting Shoreline that are trying to figure out the whole God thing. Shoreline is a place where people can come as they are and feel completely loved and safe. And so you may say, I don't even believe in God yet, don't know about the Bible, but I just say, open your heart to what the, what the Bible says because as Christians, this is, this, we, we understand this is God's word, this is God's truth. And so let's just listen to God's word together. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, Let us make my, mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, over the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And just to pause there, when it says rule over, it doesn't mean to oppress creation. It means to steward, to care for God's creation. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is God's word. This is God's truth. And we've got to grapple with that, whatever time and culture we happen to be. I want you to notice a few things in this passage. First, notice that God is speaking in the, in the fullness of his Trinitarian unity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make mankind in our image. God is speaking as Father, Son, Spirit. That God in his fullness of who he is, in three persons but one in being, one God, he says, let us make mankind in our image. And so we're made, men and women, male and female, made in the image of God, both equally in the image of God, both expressing different aspects of the image of God. And I think of these, these, these four letter C words that kind of, when you say, what, do you, what does it mean by the image of God? I think of these four words that start with the letter C. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. It's in character, that we can have character that reflects the heart of God. Not perfectly, but it's in character. It's in creativity, that God's made us to create like God created. It's in choice. We have volition. We can make decisions for good or for bad. Character, creativity, choice, and community. We're made for community. Just like God exists, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he's made us for community. I want you to notice in this passage that both men and women are made in the image of God. That God made male and female, men and women, in his image. And that's dignity. That's beauty. That's powerful. I want you to also notice that men and women together give a fuller picture of the expression of what the theologians call the imago Dei, or the image of God. There's something about men and women together that together we express the fullness of God's image in humanity. I don't think men alone or women alone, get, you don't get the whole picture. It's us together, and this is part of God's design. Let's continue in this passage. Look with me at verse 28. And God blessed them. And said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Translated, make babies. Right? Be fruitful and increase. That's a poetic way of saying, fill the earth with people. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. You steward this creation that I've made. That part of God's creation of male and female was that a male and female together can make more people. I had a chance to explain this to each of our three sons. About over 30 years ago, when our boys were all, uh, our boys were all in their 30s, so we had, li we had little boys. And over 30 years ago, Sherry and I talked and decided, you know, having three sons, that at some point they got to, when they got to a certain age, we'd have to teach them all about the birds and the bees, about sexuality, about the Bible and God's view and how we view ourselves as men and women, all that kind of stuff. And Sherry said, I have a great idea. She said, you teach all the boys and our, our, of our kids, and I'll teach all the girls. And I said, okay, um, good plan. And so here's what we did. We played a two-day trip with me and each of the boys one-on-one. -on -one. And day one was my day. Day two was their day. And I told them day one, they knew they were going to learn about the birds and the bees. They were going to learn about sexuality, about men and women, boys and girls. And they knew that was going to be our focus. Each one that I went with, one by one by one. 
And, and day two, they could choose whatever they want to do. We ended up at like Six Flags and doing kind of fun, you know, kid stuff. And so I sat down with each of my boys and we did about eight hours of learning. The first about six hours was me teaching them. The next two hours, then we took a break. Then about two hours, they taught everything back to me with all the right terms and all the right, I mean, very specific. And, and because, because I had helped to develop a curriculum for kids on this topic over 30 years ago, I, I, we, I had these great um, diagrams of the male and female anatomy, and we went through, we learned all the right terms. And I mean, it was just, and it was, and you know what? None of them was weirded out. Parents, grandparents, none of them freaked out. They were all fascinated because they knew that their dad's an expert on sex. No, that's not why. Uh, but but, they, they, but they, knew I knew what I, they knew I knew what I was talking about, right? Because I had the information. And so, so, so now I got I to gotta walk you through this a little bit. Because So with each one of them, there's a certain point in the learning. We've gone through male anatomy, female anatomy. I asked them, you know, what, what do you see as the difference between a boy and a girl and a man and a woman? And they talked about different. They talked about more external. We talked about more. We went deeper into physiological and hormonal and all those different things. And God's design. We talked about all those things. But I remember had, had the, on this side... A picture, uh, not a picture, a drawing of a female anatomy and then of a male anatomy. And I, and I explained to them, I said, okay, so now, so, so this is for a woman. I said, a woman has actually these really tiny eggs inside of her body. Even a woman in the womb. Do you know this, women? That when you were in your mother's womb? And, and, here, and here's the thing. How many eggs the average woman would have inside of her? Here's the answer. One to two million. Those that are nurses and doctors go, I know that. Some of you are going, no way. Those are tiny eggs. <laughs> You're going, how does that? But one to two million. And I said to our boys, so every woman, you know, if things are working kind of normally the way God's designed it, it will have a million to two million eggs. And I said, and every, and every man, each time that he's intimate with a woman, I said, so each time, and I said, I said to them, like with me and your mom, I said, you know, each time that we're, you know, we're together, I said, each man has, can have between one to two million uh, can, can have up to 200 million sperms. And I drew like a little, like, look, like a little tadpole. And I drew like a little egg and drew a little picture there. So I said, so all the women, women have the eggs and the men, some of you are going, how far is pastor going with this? Just hang in there. Um, <laughs> some of you are like, nobody explained this. Some of you, those of you that are leaning in are like, this is fascinating. And no, I won't meet with you and explain it later. Um, so, so I, I said, so the women have eggs and the men have the sperms. And so then I got to the point where I said to them, now, do you know how the egg from the women's body and the sperm from the men's body, do you know how they get together? How those two, because this is in the body. In the, and this is the more I, I've tried to find if they had had any friends explain anything, what they know. We got to all three of our boys before anyone had explained it to them. So in each case, all three of them said, <laughs> how? <laughs> and I explained it. That's for another sermon. Um, <laughs> And then they asked why, and I talked about I talked about spiritual intimacy, and I talked about and I talked about having making babies, and I talked about an actually fun and enjoyment, and they were like, really? And I said, yeah. And I said, and so anyway, so uh, that, is that enough, Cher? Should I stop there? Okay, my wife. Okay, um, I'm not uncomfortable talking about almost anything, and so well, but 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 here here was the beauty to be able to explain to our boys. Because they saw boys and girls and men and women different physically on the outside. But I said, even on the inside, in the most microscopic level, only women contribute the eggs. Only men contribute the sperm. And you need an egg and a sperm together to make a baby. Or if you like the wards here that have been part of our church for years, you've got four eggs and four sperms and quadruplets. Family at Shoreline Church. The kids grew up in there their whole life in the church. The parents are still part of Shoreline Church. So let's continue in the Bible passage. Here we go. Verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, there was morning the sixth day. So God looked at this male and female creation, physically, outwardly different, inwardly designed differently. And God said, this is really good. As a matter of fact, before this, if you read Genesis, each time God does something in creation, he says, good, good, good good, good. He gets to us and this design of male-female sexuality, and God says, very good. It's almost like God is spiritually going, nice job to me, you know, and what I made. It's, that's, it's beautiful. It's powerful, right? And God says, this is very good. Um, God is the great artist. God is the one who's designed us. And as we think together today and talk together about God making us as male and female, 
as men and women, boys and girls, um, I know um, there is deep pain right here in this room and with you right online in many families. I'm a pastor. I've, I walk with lots of people through lots of stuff. I've walked with a couple um, whose one of their children was struggling with their, their identity and didn't believe that they were what they were born. And they struggled over time. We prayed, we talked. There was heartache, there was struggle. And, and even for the, 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 the child who was struggling, it's not easy. They're struggling, confused, and trying to sort out. And in and, and this, and this case, that child eventually came to where they identified with what they were born and is now married to someone of the opposite sex. And they're, they, they, I think they have a great future ahead of them. I praise God for that. I'm walking with another couple, dear friends, whose child is still in the middle of all that, who's struggling, who's grappling, who's trying to sort this out. And it's painful. It's painful for that child. It's painful for the parents. It's, there's a lot going on. And I, I'm walking through that right now. I have another couple who are friends whose child dealt with that same confusion and went through a whole surgical transition. And that's painful, and that's hard for the parents, for the family, and I think even for that, that individual. Um, there's a lot of things that are flying around out there, memes and jokes and jabs and hostility. Um, that's not the heart of Jesus. We're talking about people made by him and loved by him. So as we talk about this, it's, it's not, you know, Amen to my side of the political conversation. That's not what this is about. It's about the word of God and the love of God and God's tender, beautiful creation. And so as we walk through the scriptures, I just want to ask you wherever you, you know, I, again, I walk with people and for some of you, this isn't a theoretical thing. This is just, this is your life. You're grappling with this. Just know that at Shoreline here, and I believe in any church that's really honoring Jesus you know, we want to say, talk with us, pray with us, share with us. Don't walk through that alone. And, 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 and we're going we're gonna, to, as best we can, walk through the scriptures. And we're going to explain. And we're going to come with grace, but we're always going to come with truth. All right? Let's look at Genesis 2, beginning in verse 15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. I want you to notice a few things in this passage. One, work came in. God gave people work and things to do before the fall. Do you know that work is not a product of sin? Work is in perfect paradise. We're doing productive things as people. I just think that's interesting. We're made, in this passage, you see that we're made to tend the earth and care for it. Of all people on the planet who should care for creation, it should be Christians, because this is God's world, and he made it, right? In this passage, you see that God gave freedom and boundaries. In creation, in perfect creation, in this garden, God says, okay, you can eat here, 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 stay away from here. There's boundaries, and God gives boundaries, but he also gives freedom. And we can choose to live outside of God's design. We're not puppets. He gives us, he gives us free will. And that's what makes this complicated because sometimes we choose to live outside of God's design. And then also God spoke of consequences. He said, if you eat from this tree, the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God says, when you choose to go outside my boundaries, there's consequences. Boy, you know, God gives consequences? I think creation gives consequences, nature gives consequences, and God gives consequences. And loving parents, if you've ever raised kids, if you have no consequences for kids, guess what? It's, it's a free-for-all. And so there are consequences. The passage continues in verse 18 of chapter 2. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God says, I'm going to make someone suitable. I'm going I'm I'm to bring two people together who are complementary, who suit each other, who fit each other. And when it says helper, I know people that have just kind of freaked out over that, the word helper. You know, women will say, oh, oh I'm, I'm the little helper. That's my role. If you want to get a sense of this word helper or advocate, in the Bible, when, the, when it talks about the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God is said to be our helper, our advocate. Are you in charge of the Holy Spirit? No. Right? The Holy Spirit is our helper. The same, the same concept, that same word, advocate, helper. 
But God says, I'm going to make someone that with this man fits together in a way that they help each other, that they, they become more of who they're supposed to be. The passage continues in verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper, no advocate, no partner was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. In God's creation, there was this intentional design of different counterparts. Intentionally, listen to this, intentionally not the same. And again, 40 years ago, nobody would have debated that. Now we live in a time where people say men and women are no different physically whatsoever. One of the most obvious, clear things that anyone can see just by looking, and people are saying, we're the same physically. And, it, and it, you know, God's design was actually intended to be different so, so that we could bring something to each other. Uh, a, fr- a friend of mine, Gary Thomas, and a friend of Shoreline Church, Gary has spoken. He's gonna, we hope he's going to come and preach this coming year and do a conference. He wrote Sacred Marriage, Sacred Pathways, just an amazing communicator. And Gary wrote an article recently that I, that I read, and it was called Difficult Marriage. And, and then he went on to explain, you know, people say, well, I'm in a difficult marriage. And in, the, in his article, he says, but then again, every marriage is difficult because God designed men and women differently to stretch us. It's, it's, if we were exactly the same, it might seem easier, but the fact that we're different makes it challenging, but that's a good thing. Early in our ministry, for Sherry and I, early on in our ministry, uh, Sherry actually, who, who tunes in to what's happening around her with a little more, uh, a little more, wisdom than I do and picks up things that I don't, often don't pick up. Um, I, there'd be times where I'd interact with somebody and I would just be myself. And she'd say to me after, she said, Kevin, I think you were kind of hard and you're a little bit harsh and you might have hurt that person's feelings. And I would respond by, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. That's ridiculous. And she'd say, well, I really think you might have. And, and I said, well, if that hurt their feelings, that's their problem. And she'd say, you're a pastor. Um, it is your problem if it hurt their feelings. I'm like, okay, okay. She said, well, why don't you just check in with them? And almost every time I would check in with somebody, They'd say, well, I know, I know your personality. I know your heart. And that's like a setup for, yes, that was kind of hurtful. Um, I thank God that he gave me a wife who's different than me. Because you know how many things I would miss and not see? God's designed us and wired us differently. And there's things in who God has made me that make her stronger and better. This is God's plan to bring together two different kinds of people to, bring, to make, make us more of what he wants us to be. The passage continues in verse 23 of Genesis 2. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. That's physical sexual intimacy, as well as soul intimacy, as well as emotional intimacy. And Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. It's right there in the Bible. Here we see that, that when God brings together a man and a woman in this relationship that, he, that, that he's designed and created, all right, there's spiritual oneness. There's physical oneness. There's emotional oneness without shame, the way God's designed it. Does it always work perfectly that way? No. But that's God's design, and that's God's longing. And that's what he wants us to walk into and grow into. And so like we do each week, we're going we're gonna to look at some different aspects of this and just touch on some things. I ask you just to listen well, open your heart, and see what the Holy Spirit speaks to you, all right? So first we ask the question, what does the Bible say? What the Bible says? A biblical and blessed life. What does the Bible say about, about male, female, about the goodness of this? And here's some insights. First, I am uniquely designed by God as male or female. This is part of his design. It's part of his choice. He didn't give me a vote. He didn't ask my opinion. He decided in his wisdom to make me a male. He decided in his wisdom to make my wife, Sherry, a female. He decided to give us three boys. And, in, and, and I know in our world, people are even like, well, can you even, you know, can you call children boys until they, until they decide what they're going to be? It's like, no, they're boys. Um, when, they were, when each of our boys were born, the, the doctor said, actually, with the ultrasound, 
I remember with one of the ultrasounds, he, he, he actually said, do you, want, do you want me to let you know if, this is, if it's a boy or girl? And I said, I already know. I'm looking at the ultrasound. <laughs> um, and, and so, so there, there's, a, there's a physical uniqueness. There's, all, there's also hormonal uniqueness in male and female. I've got a book right here that I've read and I, can't, I don't remember 98% of it because it's way over my head. It's called His Brain, Her Brain. It's about neuroscience and how our brains, do you know that male and female brains are different sizes? Different amounts of gray and white matter? That, that, that the, 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 the division of the hemispheres, it's called the, the, called the corpus callosum, in women, because they have estrogen, they have, there's, there's 300 million connectors between your sides of the brain, but women have more connectors because testosterone mutes the connections and estrogen intensifies it. So women process data, data faster than men. And some of you are like, yeah, so no news there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, but, but, that you could have a person who studies this look at a brain apart from the body and they could say that's a male brain or a female brain. That's God's design. So first, just to be able to say, I'm, you know, I'm designed how, how my brain is and how it works, how my, how my chemicals work, how my body is designed. This is all part of God's good plan. Also, I'm made in the image of God. We, each one of us should, should just Say, Lord, thank you that I am uniquely made in your image and there's things in me that reflect the very presence of God. I'm not God, I'll never become God, neither will you. But we are made in his image and we should celebrate that. And then I am seen as very good in the eyes of the one who created me. When God made you, male or female, he said, nice job, God. I love how I've made you. And part of what we do is then receive what it is that God's given. But also, every week we pause and we say, what does the world say? How does the world see things differently? And, and, and where's that confusion that can lead to confusion in our lives? And here's some of the differences. The world would say this, you are free to become whatever you want. You are free to, to just interchange and become whatever you want. That's, that, that wasn't what the world said 40 years ago. It wasn't what the world said 20 years ago. It wasn't what the world said five years ago. It's what many people say now. You're free just, you know, just you decide what it is you want to be. That's not biblical. Can I tell you also, it's not compassionate. It's not. The confusion that it brings is heartbreaking for God. And it should be heartbreaking for us. But that's one of the messages of the world. The world says you are hateful if you embrace God's design and not the world's affirmations and perspective. This is, I think it's one of the toughest things right now is that people who will say, if you don't affirm what the world has bought into, I mean, literally in the last two to six years, the entire, you know, at least in American culture, the entire perspective has changed. Almost nobody thought this way. Now, almost everybody thinks this way or at least says they do or won't say anything. And there's, there's this idea that you are hateful if your view is the biblical view. Can I tell you that's wrong? That's wrong. Don't believe that. If you believe what the Bible teaches, if you believe what people have believed for almost all of history, you're not a bad person for believing that. You're not a hateful person. And then the world also says you're a good person if you celebrate what the world celebrates or at least say nothing. One of the messages of the world right now is you buy in on this one, you agree, and you say what the world is, the culture is saying, um, and, and you celebrate it or keep your mouth shut. And I don't believe that the, if we walk with Jesus in both grace and truth, I don't believe the gracious thing is to say nothing. And I don't believe the true thing is to say nothing. I think as Christians, we have to walk in grace with kindness and tenderness, but we also have to speak the truth. And, but kindly, thoughtfully, compassionately. And there's too many people barking out stuff and, and, and screaming people down. I don't see that ever in Jesus, except with, with, against the religious leaders of his day, but not, not normal people. So how should I view myself, and how should I view others? If, if, this, if, if what the Bible says is still true, and I believe with all my heart it is, how should I view myself, and how should I view others? How do I understand and embrace God's design? Here's the first thing. I should celebrate the beauty and goodness of being male and female. I should celebrate, and you should celebrate in yourself and in others, the beauty of male and female. And too much now, we're just almost nervous to say anything. Boy, she's a beautiful little girl. 
What a handsome young guy. Oh, I can't say that. I can't. What, what if they, you know, we, all these questions run through my mind. Just celebrate. And, and can I tell you, my, my, um, my son, Nate, and his wife, Bryn, have one son, Cohen, and two little girls, Piper and Isla Grace. And they celebrate their male and female. They're, all, they're almost being more intentional than they probably would have, would have been because of all the confusion of the world. We as Christians need to clarify and celebrate. Also, I should show compassion and grace toward those who are hurting and struggling. There are people hurting. There are people struggling. And the first thing they need is not to be whacked over the head with your Bible or told that they're wrong. They need to be listened to, loved, heard, understand their pain, what they're walking through. And in that conversation, if you know, as, as you can, to talk about what, what you believe. And, and, and for so many people, they're struggling because they actually, a couple years ago, believed what you believe still, almost everybody. But now they're kind of confused and struggling. And so, so if, we, if we slam the door on people, the conversation's over. If we listen and talk and pray with people, the conversation's open. And that's what Jesus calls us to. And so, show compassion, show grace when people are hurting and struggling. And then also... I can affirm God's design and plan and still love people right where they are. I can believe that this book is true from beginning to end. I can believe that there are male and female, boys and girls. I can celebrate that, believe that, and hold to that and still love people who are disagreeing with me. If they'll let you. Can I tell you something? As a pastor and as a Christian, I've never blocked anybody out because I disagree with them. People block me out because they disagree with me. I've never blocked anyone out because I disagree. I've also never stopped talking about the fact of what I believe with kindness in conversational ways, praying for people, walking with them. And, and, and so just to look and say, you, you, you can walk with people and you can love people right where, right where they're at, right with what they're walking through. And as a pastor, I get to walk with people through all kinds of areas of struggle and pain and hurt and things that we deeply disagree on about sexuality and every other topic. I never saw Jesus say, because you disagree with me, go away from me. He opened his arms and his heart, but he never compromised what he believed. Never. And that's how we're supposed to live if we follow him. And then finally, how should my perspective impact my pathway? How do I learn and then how do I live? Just a couple closing thoughts. Encourage boys and girls to be who God has made them and celebrate their differences. Celebrate how God has uniquely made boys. Rejoice in that. Affirm that. Talk about that. Don't be shy about it. Not in our culture, not in our world. Don't. Kids more than ever need to hear you say, little girls, celebrate who they are. Rejoice in who they are. Build them up in that. Don't, don't be shy about that. And, and most people are hungry for that. People are, most people aren't going to push back against that. And then celebrate the unifying differences God has designed between men and women. Celebrate the fact that we have, we have different body designs. Don't deny it. Don't fight about it. Just celebrate it. I love that God has made us different. We should rejoice in his design as men and as women. And we should look at ourselves and say, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. We need to rejoice in that and hold to it. And then we need to show love and compassion toward people even when we disagree. Even when your heart is in strong disagreement, show love Show compassion. Show the presence of Jesus. There may be people after this message today who say, you know, Pastor Kevin's a hateful person because he talks about this topic. Please talk with me about that. Please come and talk with me. Today, Sherry and I are actually greeting new people out in the courtyard. But in the weeks to come, if, if you're grappling with something, if you're grappling with this topic in your own life, in your own family, please reach out and we'll set up a pastor to come and just sit and talk with you and talk and pray. And I promise you, they will come with the same tone I'm talking right now or even kinder. But I also promise you, we'll never compromise what the word of God says. That's our starting point. That's our finishing point. But we're gonna talk and pray because we want God's best for everyone. Don't travel through these roads alone. And one more time, if you have high school kids that are connected to this church, please do all you can to get them here tomorrow night for the next six weeks. If it means missing a practice, I think it's worth it. I do. And you as parents, grandparents of kids any age, if you want to grapple with these topics, with two of our pastors and their wives digging deep, deep, more than I can in a sermon, 
I encourage you to be here also tomorrow night and be part of that because it is, it's so important. Who am I? Who are you? Men and men, women, male and female, made in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully. And God says that is very good. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. As we close this time together, I pray this is not the end of the conversation. I pray that there are many, many conversations that come out of this. I pray that no one hears judgment or hatred or anger, but that they see the presence of Jesus and know that you, Jesus, meet people right where they are and lead them where you would have them be. We pray that that would be the heart and tone of every single one of us. God, thank you that you created us, male and female, in your image. Beautifully different, beautifully complementary. And I thank you personally that I am a better person because of the woman you've placed in my life. And I believe that my wife feels the same way. May you show that again and again and again as we learn what it means to be men and women in a world where things are confused, but where you still speak your truth with clarity and love. I pray out of this we'll have many conversations with others that will be filled with grace and truth that honor Jesus and bring your truth. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Before I stand and send you off with a word of blessing, before I invite you to stand, if you're new at Shoreline and you're on campus, Sherry and I are going to be out here. If you go out the main doors to the left, we got a spot there. If we've not had a chance to meet you or, or welcome you or greet you, if you're here for the first time or been here for a year and never come to say hi, please come on over, say hi. We'd love to welcome you to Shoreline Church and just get a chance to meet you and chat with you a little bit. If you need prayer and you're online, you can live chat with your online host or you can email us your prayer needs and we will respond to those and lift those up. And if you're on campus, we're going to have teams up on both sides already starting to kind of come up here, and they would love to pray for you. If they're wearing a rival team jersey, then just pick someone else to pray with. But, uh, but we want to pray with you. And if you're new at Shoreline on campus, if you're new, uh, we welcome you. We're so glad you're here. Before you leave, go by the Connection Center and let them know you're new. And they want to give you a warm welcome and give you a little gift and thank you for coming. If you're new online, just text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen right in front of you and we will reach out to you wherever you are. If you're able to stand online on campus, if you're able to stand, will you please stand with me? As you go from this place, in every topic, in every situation you face, Go in grace and truth. Show the good love of God and his kindness in all that you do. And never compromise on the truth that he has taught us in his word. God bless you. God be with you. Enjoy the day. And if you watch the game, I won't say anything else. God bless you. Have a great day. Praise.